for hitting that lower market. Um, so you don't have to always drive so far. But thank you everyone for joining today. I'm Nicole Kelly. Um, I'm on the board for Startup Grind Maryland. I'm also the CEO of Acquisitions for Genius Visionary and I buy companies. So I usually am buying companies once they have reached profitability and then we look to scale and help those owners exit. Um, we are joined today with the fantastic Mel Litter who I've been on the board with now for gosh, I think it's been a year maybe, something like that, um, and have had the privilege of working with her and really getting to understand what we can do as an organization from partnerships, but also the expertise that she brings forward. So thank you so much for joining us today, Mel. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here today um, and allowing me to have this time to uh, rant and rave a little bit about the value of partnerships in general and strategic partnerships, um, which I believe are, are the next level of all of that. So as you can see from the bio that's up on the screen, um, I have a long, diverse um, background, career in, in many sectors, um, anywhere, anything from currently higher education, but I've also been in finance and higher education way back, to um, real estate investment um, and portfolio management and local government um, and all sorts of different things because it's about a 45 year career. And what I found to be consistent throughout my career has been the value of leveraging the knowledge and um, uh, resources that other entities and individuals bring to the table. I could not ever have accomplished anything in my career if I had tried to do it by myself. I'm a serial entrepreneur, um, but uh, let me share the screen for a minute and show you a little illustration of what I'm talking about with that, um, as long as I can actually find it. And I don't think it's gonna come up for me. Um, here it is, okay. So this is, this is my website uh, from my company. And um, we can't see what you're seeing. So just okay. make sure you hit share screen and then you need to select the tab you wanna show. Okay, hang on a second. I apologize, everybody. Um, see, I need my partners at Startup Grind here to do this, but I'm trying to get back into us now. I may not even be able to get into that because I can't find it on my, here it is. Um, select a window there. Let me see if you can see that. Now, can you see? Yeah. Great, okay. So this, this is my website. Not that that's really critical to all of this. Um, but what is important about this when it comes to understanding partnerships is first, when you're building a company, you're building a team. So my team consisted of a bunch of people along with myself, um, some of which you may know, it's not really important for this presentation who they are, but you all are building or are already engaged in companies, um, entity startups where you have built your kind of um, core uh, group of people, your, your strategic partners in your business itself. But this started out as Elemental started out just as myself. And then, you know, through talking to Abe Brockman and Dana French and, and my son is in this and all of that, we started kind of building out the idea of what this Elemental Impact Solutions would do. So you've all been through that. So that's, that's one type of strategic partnership as you grow and develop your team internally. Um, and then as I'm sure many of you have done, you may, you, you may find yourself building a board of directors depending on the type of legal structure that you end up being. I chose to be, where this is a for-profit, I chose to, to build a board of advisors. And why advisors? And some of these people you'll recognize too. Um, they all come from different industries. Um, they all come from, I didn't mean to flip on here, I'm scrolling with my finger. So that's making me get people that I don't need to do. Let me go back to that. Um, why advisors? Because I can, I can, ask them to pop in and out of projects and programs and help me through their connections. All of these people have networks of their own. Kathy Kellen Brady, who I keep going to, is the CEO of Fitzy, uh, where I was VP of uh, strategic partnerships for her and um, a grant writer fundraiser for them so that they could get into their new um, center that they have. Um, again, Knowing Kathy and inviting her to be in my company then actually gave me access to become part of Fitzy. Um, and I worked as a consultant first and then I became part of their staff before I moved over here to Frederick Community College where they created the role that I have. Um, 
And I got this role at my community college because of my ability to connect people and organizations together uh, with impact intersections where goals and missions align and each party brings to the table um, either uh, additional resources, time, money, expertise, knowledge, um, legal structures and so forth, um, or, or things that are completely kind of different. Um, and so you can kind of see through all of this who some of these people are. Soha, for instance, is, um, is head of Startup Grind in, um, I didn't mean to do that either. She's head of Startup Grind in uh, Cairo. And I met her through Startup Grind about two years ago and she became one of my advisors. So, um, so it's, it's pretty cool how once you start talking to people, you meet other people. So you'll see Nima Farshi on here from the Uni University of Maryland and Andrew Fellows. I have met and made so many strategic partnerships through uh, mentoring capstone groups for each of their parts of uh, the University of Maryland. And so this is, this is a, an example. I wanna go in and show you another example. So let me close this one out. Um, this, uh, so there I got to that. I, I somehow lost my screen sharing. So let me go back to that. Okay, um, and can you see this? Yes. Okay. So this is a this is another example of, and I'm going to talk through this because I didn't. So here's the thing: I could have done a PowerPoint giving you the the formal educational training PowerPoint screen presentation on building partnerships and strategic partnerships. But what I what I want to get across is the point that when you're building a company and you're creating the relationships and partnerships that you need to have to be successful, you got to first go with your gut. You've got to know what your business is about, you know, where you want to be, what your time frame is, and where you where what you don't have. You know, you know what your strengths are, you believe in your in your business or your company or your organization. Um, but where is it that you perhaps don't have the expertise and the knowledge and so forth. So this visual, this, this is a, a one, it has stuff behind it that I'm not gonna go through, but this particular um, screenshot is a visual for the president of the college about where I am recommending we focus our workforce development training educational work. But here's, here's where strategic partnerships come into play. If you look at this one, the aerospace um, and engineering, what's a community college gonna be able to do with engineering and aerospace? We're a two year uh, basic skills, um, core competency institution that's, that's meant to engage everyone in our community at all levels of knowledge and give them pathways to either starting their own business, going on to higher education or being, you know, finding a really good job that they can live with. and and um, and. And, uh, and grow in. So how are we gonna tackle aerospace and engineering if we take that on? We're gonna do that through strategic partnerships. And a, a definition of a strategic partnership is that it, it helps you increase your financial resources. It increases uh, your ability to um, in, uh, perform additional tasks. It allows you to do a hub spoke expansion of what you're trying to do. It, in other words, increase your capacity and, you know, and, and bring in the other expertise and skills and knowledge. So uh, we have colleagues now at the Space Foundation, which is a uh, international organization that's focused on education, leveraging the concept of space, um, but with really the core training revolving around, you know, what does it take to live on Mars and the moon, since we're going to be doing that sometime within the next century much sooner if uh, NASA and, and the Space Foundation are correct, um, we have to first know how to live in a changing environment here on our planet. So it, this is a Venn diagram, overlaps with FCC's interest and commitment to agriculture and forestry because you have to uh, have food and you have to have clean water and you have to have energy. So that goes into the energy and environment and you have to have technology. So it overlaps into um, you know, AI and, uh, and all the things that come with uh, technology and it overlaps into health. 
um, because that has to do with food, that has to do with um, uh, the state of our, our physical and mental health and so forth. So the point of this visual, uh, particularly using a Venn diagram to describe what, to kind of illustrate what a strategic partnership should look like is that we overlap um, in terms of all the things we need. Um, the things on the side of this are just workflows. The, the president of the college, in order to be really successful in our community, needs to be connecting directly with the constituency that we serve, which is ultimately our business owners, because we're training um, the workforce of the future or upskilling the current workforce. And so again, very important for her to make strategic partnerships by talking, not just sending emails, uh, not just handing out business cards, not just attending networking events, but actually really finding out what can we do for others that, that are going to be useful, um, helpful partners for ourselves. So someone said, when do I discontinue a partnership? I think that was you, Meredith. Uh, when is it time to kind of move on? I would say when you're building strategic partnerships, don't ever put them aside, shift them. Think of, of system shift. And, and because you may need them later on, or they may need you later on. Um, and so I don't think that's what you were, were referencing about kind of discarding a partnership, but when do we put our energy elsewhere? Which going back to my first screen about having advisors and being able to bring them in and out, it's that concept. So you wanna build your portfolio of resources and those are partnerships. So, um, there are legal partnerships where, where you're going to help one product to get into another market and you're gonna to have to work with patents, you're gonna to have to work with all the legal partnerships of, of um, intellectual property and things like that. But first you have to have trust for someone to trust you with their ideas and their products and allow you to integrate them into your business or your organization and to allow you to integrate what you're doing into theirs, you have to have built that trust and rapport. Um, so again, you want to, you want to have um, meaningful conversations about are your missions and goals aligned? Are you trying to get to the same place in the same time frame? And who can bring what to the table to help that happen? We are so much stronger together in partnerships than we are separate. So let me ask you, you know, kind of move on a little bit with, let me turn this over to, to all of you to, uh, and I'm going to stop screen sharing. Um, because it's not really necessary now, and, um, and open this up for us to have a conversation. So would, would some of you answer the question, what does a business or an organization from your perspective need to be successful? I mean, I've got my list, but what do you all think? I can call names, but, I don't, but if you don't want to participate. Well, that's a answer. darn good question, Mel. Uh, well, the number one thing is you've got to build something people want. That's the number one thing that kills startups. Number two is co-founder problems. So those are the top two. And then the third one is runway. Did that answer your question? Well, I think that's, yeah. So you've, you've addressed people, capital, um, and market, which are, are things you've got to understand. What else could we add to that that's important as you're, you're building that, that specifically pertains to partnerships, really? I mean, I guess um, I'd, I'm not going to call names. I'll let somebody else do that. Okay. Um, I would say like a mutual understanding between how, I mean, you said it already, how you can help each other. So building those relationships, um, I guess, an ecosystem that would benefit each other. I love I love that because um, um, ecosystem was was mentioned when we were all chatting in the very beginning and about how we need to develop uh, a robust ecosystem and that's that's kind of the that's the key I think to being successful in anything that we do is to understand what's out there I mean it's so broad in terms of what people are doing uh, but we're all in so many ways have, have any of you experienced and I, if you don't all raise your hand I'm going to say you're you're Fibbing. Um, any of you ever uh, lived in, an, in, a, in a place or had your work in a place where you didn't experience siloing in activities? 
<laughs> so everybody's going to raise their hand. So, so oh, def definitely be, siloing has happened. Everything is siloed. You know, um, and before the pandemic, siloing was, of course, uh, barriered by how far away everything was. And now mm -hmm. we're all on Zoom. And so siloing seems to continue a little bit, which indicates it's not just based on distance. So um, that's a very good point, Mel. Now we've got a couple of hands raised. I'm not sure if Randall uh, had raised because he wanted to answer your question earlier or he has a different question. But if we're gonna stick with the question you just answered, Mel, Randall, is that something you wanted to address or? Yeah, um, so from a partnership perspective, one of the things that I see is absolutely critical is an understanding internally of what is the problem that they're going to solve for you. And, and what that really translates into is what does success look like? What does good look like as a result of that partnership? You don't have to know all the ins and outs of how to get there, but if you don't have clarity on what you're trying to accomplish and the problem you're trying to solve with that partner, you're not gonna have a good interaction with them. And worst case, you get taken advantage of, and I see a lot of companies who are inexperienced in this space get taken advantage of by predatory companies that that just feed off of, of that ignorance. And um, uh, on, on the flip side, you know, you want to be able to make sure that your goals and directions for that engagement are aligned, that you have a, a, a stake, that both parties have a stake in the success beyond just the payment of that relationship, especially for early stage companies. Um, and I work in, I'm, I'm in the technology area, so we live and breathe partnerships uh, with other tech colleagues and vendors and, and this and that all the time. Um, and so kind of those are some of the things that I would put in there as considerations for what founders need to be thinking about when they're looking at partnerships. I think that is phenomenal. You took you took a whole section of, of um, my notes and and put it and said it so much more clearly than than I was going to. So I appreciate that. That is right on target. Thank you for that. Anybody else want to address either what you don't uh, what you don't know about partnerships or what you've experienced that might be very useful to the group? Because we've all had part. I mean, if you've ever been married, you've had a best friend, you've been you know whatever you know you have personal partnerships. If you've ever built a business, which we all are doing, then you've got partnerships you're you're, you're doing. If you've ever hired a contractor to, to help you out with painting or your house or doing, you know, or, or working on your car, you've got a partnership. You choose, you know, exactly the way it was said on what's going to bring value um, and help you reach your goal um, the most effectively for you. And then I just want to put the other spin on that. It's, recipro it's reciprocal. You have to be able to add value back for a strategic partnership to really work. Um, how about anyone else? Now, Cheryl, is your hand still up on this question? No, I was commenting. I wanted to comment on something she said, Mel said um, earlier. Okay. Okay. Please. Then okay. we'll come back this, to this. Okay. Quickly, this new company has um, a product for the Space Force. So um, that's a huge opportunity there. And the company that we'd like to partner with has unsuccessfully marketed it to the DOD in the past. So oh. just wanted to put that out there. It's well, let's follow. So here we're, here we're creating a little bit of a network ecosystem. That's something we should mm -hmm. follow up on um, outside of here to see if I can help make some connections for you through the connections I have, which is another part of strategic partnership building is to always be thinking about who you know, it should be lighting up for you like a circuit board. When you hear something like that, all of a sudden you're thinking, okay, this individual and this individual and this individual would be really good connections. And out of that connection may come a bridge, which is the, the link to your strategic partnership. So always think a little bit beyond your, your, um, you know, your initial kind of relationship and think about that ecosystem that's out there because you may be surprised at how much uh, overlap there really is going out there. And I, that, as I was talking about silos, um, one of the things that, that comes to mind when I talk about silos is that we really miss the ability to leverage resources when we don't uh, share and take a little bit of a risk of talking about what we're working on. Now, there's got to be confidentiality when you're creating a model or a, 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 a tool or a technology, because as, as was just mentioned, 
you can get taken advantage of. You can lose control of your idea. You can lose control of your company. You can, you know, someone will run with it and do something else. So you have to be, uh, this is where things like memos of understanding are helpful, but they're not legally binding really. Letters of intent are helpful, but they're, they're not really binding either. Legal partnerships and non-disclosure disclosures are stronger but they're not 100% protective. So it's that trust factor. Um, um, I think, you know, again, to stress the point that strategic partnerships are, are most successful and advantageous um, when the partners have shared aligned uh, missions and, and kind of value ethics, if that makes sense. And if you can assess that as you get to know your potential partners that you want to work closely with, you'll minimize some of the risk of, of bad behavior that, that happens out there. Um, so who have any of you actually put together sort of a, a strategic plan for how you want to grow your ecosystem and your partnerships? And uh, if you have, could you give us a, a kind of a little bit of an example of, of how you structured that and what your motivation was for choosing um, in fact, maybe I should narrow it down and say, would a few of you offer an example of the best partnership you have experienced in your current business? Um, and why was it why was it good? Well, quick response. You just nailed me. It's been too long. OK, so I have some homework to do after this. Thank you. <laughs> I can give an example of a fantastic par partnership I had. OK. I had a patent on a medical device and I needed a prototype. And I went to a design shop called HS Design. I found them because I was already looking at the endpoint. The endpoint was a medical device excellent award. So they're called Medeas. So I had the output that I wanted before I sought out the company. So then I found the company and I, I knew nothing. It was my first, it was my first rodeo, so to speak. And they really walked me through the whole process and they, they gave me the contract. I had to just trust them. And I did, um, you know, I know people say lawyer, well, you don't have a lot of money, um, but long story short, they prepared stuff that I was using when I prepared my SBIR for the National Science Foundation. I used documentation from them that I didn't even know they, that I needed. And they proactively had provided me all of this in the contract package, um, along with uh, video, prototype videos, um, et cetera, et cetera. It was absolutely phenomenal. They got bought out and the guy in charge of it is skiing in the Alp these days. So wonderful. Wow. Yeah. Meredith, do you have one? You look like you, like you were, you've got a. No, I have one that didn't work out. Well, let's hear that. Let's hear the flip side. <laughs> just, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that was the next question. Is, you okay. know, do you, want, do you want me to wait? I'm happy to wait if somebody else has a successful one they'd like to talk about. I, we could go in. We can go good and bad. It doesn't. I mean, we could just because these stories are helpful because what? Yeah. What went wrong? What wasn't right about it? Yeah. Okay, I, want, I, want the, I want the tea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now that I've, I've dangled the carrot, right? So we had um, a client that we were working with and um, they ended up pitching us a really, what we thought was an exciting idea for an app. I'm in staffing. So um, he um, was um, talking about building an app that uh, my partner and I thought was a great idea. Um, and it was pre-COVID, so it might have um, been worked a little differently after COVID hit, but um, ultimately, like we got, we got excited about this app. We felt like it would be really great for candidates and a faster way for clients to be able to, to candidate match and stuff. So, um, um, that kind of reeled us in. And then he was also starting his own, um, staffing company at the same time to focus in, um, like mortgage and finance area. So, um, we, um, we're excited because we had an additional partner. He had more funding. So we were like talking about what the partnerships would look like, 
what our roles would be, the growth that we would have um, in in each of our careers between the three of us. And um, it was all like, we felt we met multiple times. We had tons of phone calls. We felt like we really vetted it out. My partner and I felt like we really vetted this out well. Um, and then, um, so we, we signed on, um, and we ended up working together for a year. And just as it went on, we just found, like you mentioned the values and ethics earlier, and we just started to realize like, it wasn't a drastic difference. But it was like just differences in certain values and ethics and execution and relationships and things that um, Faith and I really value and um, wanted to build our company off of. And we just started to see kind of that division. And so at the same time, we, she and I started to come together even more and recognize like, hey, we're really on the same page. Why are we working with this other person that's bringing this division in. So let's just go back to our own, you know, let's just work together. We don't, we can do this on our own. We don't have to have this. So that was a decision that um, because of the partnership, it was a great experience. I don't think I would ever say like, I wouldn't change anything. I think we learned a lot from it, Um, but it did make us realize like, okay, we, we are on the same page as co-founders and let's just, you know, do what we do best and do it together. We don't need to to have a shiny new object, <laughs> um, you know, do, I guess like kind of distract us from what we were trying to build. So, so well, that makes me you. think of what Mel said about uh, shifting because you just described something that had pros and cons, pluses and minuses, values mm-hmm. on both sides of it, which to me, that's what it's about. Yeah. I was, I was going to say exactly that about the shifting thing. Again, you don't want to throw that relationship out, but you shifted. And right. we're always, I think as we're building our businesses and we're moving through um, the stages of being, you know, to success, we're shifting. So let's talk for a minute and, and anybody stick your hands up if you want to interject it, because this is a conversation now. You're all experts. I'm supposed to be leading the conversation as ask the experts. So ask me any questions, but you all can answer them because you're you're in the trenches. That makes you experts in this because you're experiencing building partnerships that are going to help you be successful every day that you're out there. You're sitting right here building partnerships in this in this forum. You had the um, you had the intelligence to join this group today and and want to hear uh, more about something that's critical to your business. And you learn from each other, not just from, um, I just got a red heart from Patrick. Um, but um, so I, I wanted to talk, funding, let's talk about funding for a minute. Has anybody in this group experienced seeing like that? Now, no one can grow on grants, but let's use that as an easy example. But we could go and talk about sponsorships. We could talk about borrowing, getting lines of credit, all that stuff. For funding venture capital going in and pitching and getting you know your seed money raised and so forth because you're you're competing for resources for financial resources how do we collaborate in order to get more a larger piece of the pie so that we're not it's not a, a win-loss it's a win-win every time we try to do something like raise capital and grants are a perfect example just to say you might have an nsf grant come through you might have a uh a small business grant come through and you've written your application or you've gone through the criteria and you say, I just don't meet this criteria. Maybe, I, maybe I'm supposed to be a nonprofit in order to apply, or maybe I have to have a, a, I'm a higher education institution, so I can't do it. So you just kind of set it aside. Why not flip your thinking and say, hmm, who do I know that I trust that I can strategically partnership with to go for this money? And my, my, piece of it is clearly defined. What will I bring to the table? And do I have the courage and confidence to allow someone to be the lead on this grant and trust them to, you know, to take care of me as, as one of the critical pieces of why they're going to get the grant? I'm just not quite qualified. It can be the same thing when you're going and you're pitching and you're, you're trying to raise capital to launch um, a company or the next stage of your of your product development or whatever is sometimes collaborating with another company um, or group will help you be more successful because now you have more credibility. If you're new in a concept or you're new in a company, um, 
you don't have a track record in, in what it is you're trying to raise money for. So strategic partnerships can help you have the credibility and the strength you need to get the resources, the capital that you may need to get started that you might not be able to do on your own because you don't have that, that kind of resume track record. Um, so anyone want to comment on that? Well, James, his hand is well, up. James, hand is up. And, uh, you know, Mel, you just really said it, that sometimes you have to join someone else's parade to get to where you're going. Yeah. James? Yeah, so... Uh... I love I love what you're talking about because it, it it's so real on like my actual life experience. When I started my company, um, we set out for a stretch goal that we knew wasn't feasible. It was an eighty four million dollar grant with the Climate Smart Commodities, the USDA, and the power of going for a grant that you know you can't get, but to use it not only for technical guidance but also to as a vessel to to bridge those connections to subject matter experts. When I would call Joseph Sullivan at, at University of Maryland and say, hey, would you like to collaborate with us on an $84 million grant? The obvious answer is going to be yes, right? Like, you know, if you go to something with, with something that's not big. So I don't even think we got reviewed for that grant. There was so many crazy things that happened, but um, with like the, the workspace failing and there had to be email submissions anyway. Getting back to the the point from from going for that grant that stretch goal, we've established you know three or four advisors that are still on the team. Um, we've gotten uh, there's a licensing for a patent that's happening right now with the with one of the schools, and um, more so I've I've spoken at the the college as as a which is crazy as a subject matter expert when I'm not not, um, but but it all comes from you know taking taking a bold swing that you you don't you don't really care if you hit the home run right you just need to get used to swinging the bat and seeing the ball and and using non-conventional uh vessels to empower people to essentially give chefs their own kitchen i i think i i, I just wanted to share kind of my paradigm and 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 just like what what you're saying you know, we didn't have any money. We didn't have any revenue. We didn't have anything. And and now we're partnered with all these colleges and have advisors that have been, you know, uh, they have like over 10,000 citations. And it, it, it came from, yeah, we didn't want to win. We wanted to organize. We wanted to refine. We wanted technical guidance. Love it. Love it. Thank you, Aaron. I just wanted to uh, say, you know, I think bringing a partner in for a grant is a great idea, but I guess I think you have to be careful because, sorry, um, you don't just bring them in to get the grant. You have to make sure that there's value added and you really understand the expectations. Uh, otherwise, there's going to be, uh, quite frankly, animosity and, and other pieces that come into play. And at times, it's going to be obvious you only brought them in to get the grant. And so I think you just have to be careful as you uh, as you move forward that everyone has a clear understanding of what the uh, expected contribution is supposed to be and make a clear understanding of who gets what out of the grant, because that in itself can create a serious amount of friction as you go forward toward the, uh, the process. And then all of a sudden at the end, well, wait a second, I didn't know this or that and, and so on and so forth. So again, I, I just think everyone needs to be clear of the uh, of the expectations and make sure it's equitable too. I absolutely agree with you. That's where that trust part comes in. You have to really, you know, you have to be, um, uh, you have to be in, what's the word I want, intentional um, as you build your partnerships. And, and not just for the grant writing, because as was mentioned when Meredith mentioned before about having a partner that eventually you kind of go off in separate directions, you know, why do people get divorced? It's it's because the the partnership didn't meet the expectation that you had uh, originally, or things changed over time. So, um, or you I kind of graduate. It, I mean, it, it, you graduate. I mean, suddenly you know it's successful, yeah. and everyone it it worked out, and so everyone goes to the next level as well. That's right. That's right. I mean, there's a, there's an old saying: you're supposed to plan your divorce at the wedding, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. Yeah, right. Yeah. But, um, but Mel, um, Lynn just brought up a great point about the commitment 
and then the willingness to have the hard conversations and do the work. And somewhere in the process of building a strategic partnership, you know, you got to get to that point. You got to get where you've gone through that. Communication. It's communication. Lynn, do you want to expand on that at all? Because it's you got to have those constant check-ins back and forth. Yes. So Baltimore Green Justice Workers Cooperative, Kimberly, is a nonprofit startup. And it's founded by myself and Kimberly Armstrong. <laughs> and I was saying that when you ask the question about successful partnerships, I, I, I truly believe that because we came together to found this organization, that in and, in and of itself is an example of a successful partnership because we're both committed we're willing to have the hard conversations and boy, do we have hard and tough and difficult conversations, but we're also both committed to doing the work. Um, another great partnership that we have is with two professors from Towson University. Mm -hmm. So we attended a conference last year that was targeted toward nonprofits at Towson, helping nonprofits grow their capacity. And we met two professors there who um, were willing to help us um, with our strategic planning for our board of directors. And so we've been working with them now for over a year. And we just had our first uh, strategic planning uh, retreat for our board members, which gave us the opportunity to rethink um, our organization's mission and our vision. And we actually voted to um, revise that. That was more inclusive of not just the vision of the founding members, but also the board of directors as well, uh, which was very important in terms of making sure that people saw themselves in the work that we were planning to do and that we are planning to do as an organization. Fantastic point. Chris, you've got your hand up before I comment on that. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to just follow on a little bit with Lynn, but, but particularly with what Aaron said about, you know, making sure that there is a mutually compelling value proposition for both parties. Um, the one thing that I would like to add there is that, um, this is not something that should be entered into rapidly or entered into lightly. Um, that it needs to require an incredible amount of due diligence on both sides of the coin. And when I say that, unfortunately, we as entrepreneurs, matter of fact, we as a, we as human beings suffer from a situ suffer from a continue from a um, a condition called the Dunning-Krieger effect, which is basically um, we have an idea, we have an opportunity, and we're at the beginning of this curve. On one side, it's expectations. On the other, on the other hand, it's it's time. And what happens is when we enter into say. a new idea, business ownership, et cetera, all of a sudden on both sides of the coin, we go from zero on the expectation side to a peak very, very rapidly. And that peak is called, the right way to put it is it's the, it's the peak of inflated expectations. I like, I personally like to call it the, uh, the peak of Mount Moron, which means <laughs> that, you know, we, we get all enthused, we get all incited, we, we begin to think with rose-colored glasses of all the possibilities. But the one thing that we don't do is to put a break on ourselves as we move up this mountain and say, okay, now what are our risks? And what are the potential problems and issues that we may have to address, whether that's interpersonal, whether that's capabilities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The point being is that what you want to do is not to get to the top of Mount Moron, I'm sorry, the, you know, the peak of inflated expectations, because as soon as you do, all of a sudden the bubble bursts and reality sets in. And now you go from that peak of inflate, the peak of inflated expectations to the valley of despair. 
And so what happens is reality sets in. And now all of a sudden you've gone from having this wonderful concept to having to deal with and clean up all the realities that you found in the process, where if you take a little more time as you go up that mountain of expectations, you can flatten that curve so that you don't get blindsided by all of the, um, I don't want to call it negatives, but all of the risks that you might not have previously considered. I just wanted to throw that out. So, uh, yeah, so to, yeah, to sum that up, there's, there's a fact, uh, or it used to be a fact, maybe it's not true anymore, that more people die coming down from Everest than scaling up Everest because they fail to plan for the descent. Now, to your point, Chris, what you're talking about are partnerships that you may make that are going to stay together for long periods of time. I would differ a little in my opinion. I think that strategic partnerships can also interweave in what you're doing so that you can be very intentional uh, with your partnerships for particular purposes. And let me give you an, uh, and, and not necessarily expect them to be climbing the mountain with you the whole way. So let me give an example. Uh, the national, the Frederick National Labs is here in Frederick. And I got to know um, uh, one of the folks over there who's amazing innovator uh, when I was over at Fitzy. And we've kept a, you know, our, our communication going, never with a real um, purpose of, of what we were going to do, but just kind of keeping it in mind. Well, lo and behold, when the Space Foundation NASA connection kind of came together, I picked up the phone and I called my contact over there and said, oh, uh, actually, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm losing the point of the story. I was actually at a, a committee that I worked on and I ran into someone that works with, um, with him, with Vlad over at the Frederick National Labs. And she told me that he was standing up an educational institution. And I said, well, you know, a training program. And I said, well, I need to know about this because I'm at the college, maybe we can collaborate. But when I, call, when I called him and I was talking to him about it, we got on the subject of what's hot for his programs. Well, they're starting to talk to the same people we're starting to talk to, kind of, and on health um, related things that have to do with our future in space and our future in a changing climate. So now we we're intersecting to align the strategic partners on this initiative to kind of bring these partners into our community that are going to spoke out to a bunch of other organizations and be impactful in our school system, be impactful in our business community, be impactful in our, um, you know, in our startup community and so forth uh, in all the different industries. So there's, there's an ecosystem of, of now strategic partnerships that are coming to play that will all take on lives of their own um, because we're going to let them, you know, grow and flourish on their own. But, but being aware, keeping your, your radar up and your ears open to what those people that you meet are doing, uh, what they're passionate about, what people talk about that they believe in, those are where you're going to find your, you know, your, your, um, your glue, because otherwise you get un unintended consequences, like Chris was saying, where you know you uh, you miss opportunities or you deeply align in, in too narrow um, a pathway, and you cut off other the ability to to uh, shift those partnerships, take a little different track, and then bring them back, and then you need to later. So it's it's a it's a very intricate weaving of of resources. Um, when you're building partnerships. Yeah, I, I just want to say, um, Chris, you, you you spoke to my heart on that because I, I literally have to, I, I've trained myself now that like, I mean, I'll do it right after this meeting as well, or I will go on a walk for about two or three miles because preserving your flow theory, right? Preserving that calm logic is what's going to, you know, the more you, you um, make that a habit, um, you find that productivity that certain things just happen better and you're also stressing less too because you're not getting too emotional yeah. you're just kind of you know letting letting the birds chirp and 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 breathe in the air and um yeah i i just just from someone that's been on the cold email side feverishly getting excited you know from a response to now learning the power of saying no um yeah. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to piggyback off that briefly. Very good, 
very good point, you know, and something that I'm, I'm learning. And so that reinforced something from both of you and, uh, and all of you here in the group that I have to keep working on for myself. I get very excited and very passionate about projects that I'm working on and I get very impatient. Um, and I'm trying to train myself as I build partnerships and leverage partnerships to be more patient um, and to let things unfold as they should, because I get very, you know, working in academia and you all have experienced it working, you know, with any kind of government agency, academia and government are slower than molasses in winter. Um, and it's just, for those of us that, that you know, entrepreneurial and, and so forth and idea people, you know, those ideas just fire us up. So I love this, you know, the taking the walk. I've started going back to yoga, um, you know, four or five times a week so I can just kind of chill <laughs> um, and, and just not stress because we, bur we burn down our bridges when we get too, too fired up on stuff. Yeah, um, James, back, back to what you were saying, I, I applaud you for, um, you know, being mindful and meditative enough to know that you have to do this for yourself. Um, just to share with you a couple of things that I do is I try to make sure that I don't schedule one meeting after another immediately so that I can I can build mm. in 10 or 15 minutes where I can sit back and reflect in silence and and then begin writing out of the downside of that that you know Mount Mount Moron of okay what would happen if what would happen then so that I hopefully bring myself out of that level of inflated expectations and bring myself down where I'm thinking more calmly, more logically, um, et cetera. And sometimes I'll go out on the back patio and write in my journal for 15 minutes, et cetera. <clears throat> the other thing that I do is on a daily basis is, is tell myself when I get up in the morning, Chris, remember, practice the concept of you got to crawl before you can walk, before you can run. Therefore, until you've learned how to crawl well, i.e. get the basics down and spent the time on the fundamentals, it's difficult to walk and then it's even more difficult to run. But yet what we do as human beings is think that we can go from laying on our backs in a crib to running a hundred yard dash in three weeks. And we all know that that's probably not going to happen. But James, I really appreciate your input on that. Thank you. Randall, you have, you've had your hand up. Yeah, uh, well, I'm kind of, but uh, Chris actually kind of just talked about what I was going to get into, touching on the state of flow and giving yourself space. Something that's absolutely critical, it happens in founders, doesn't just happen as founders, though, it happens with many, many folks, particularly if you come from larger organizations, that you start to confuse um, busy with productivity. And that is, a, you've got to carve out that space because you need that time for that deep thinking. You need that time to uh, dig in and, and understand really truly what is going to drive value for you from that relationship, from that experience, et cetera. And, and that's something that uh, unfortunately we don't, we don't allow ourselves so much time for to do that type of deep thinking because it's further off. It, it feels like I don't know how to get there. I don't know what the value is, et cetera, et cetera. And that's that's where I think we need to be uh, better at uh, helping ourselves be kind to our future selves. You know, to Chris's point about walk, crawling, walking, running, I, I frequently say things like um, make it work first and then make it better. It, it needs to work and be ugly before you can improve it. And if you try to make improve it before you made it work, you're just adding complexity that doesn't add value. And, and that's really going back to kind of the foundation of what is, what is the problem you're trying to solve and why is this the best tool or mechanism by which you can solve that? Well said, I mean, this is this is amazing. And I'm, I'm you know, actually, I'm getting so much out of this because I'm recognizing, you know, I'm a serial entrepreneur founder as well, that I create my own mountains, you know, um, and roller coasters by not taking enough space to process uh, the pros and cons. And part of this comes from when you take that step back, don't you find basically that there, that there may be another approach 
that's going to be more, you know, more la lasting and more successful and impactful. Um, and, so, and sometimes I think we all don't, we also don't speak the same language. We don't realize that, and I'm not speaking foreign language, even when we talk, you know, speak, and we talk about use certain words, other people in our industry are hearing it differently. Um, and so we have to be cognizant of the fact that maybe we're, we're not explaining what it is we expect our expectations and what we mean. This happens, Meredith, you probably run into this in um, staffing, that often people's skill sets are not conveyed accurately or well enough uh, for what an employer might want because someone might have great project management skills. Um, because they've been doing a certain type of work, but it's, it's not, they're not able to articulate that in a way that a potential uh, client or, or hiring agency or even a funder will understand and appreciate and get and want to support. Um, so we're, we're kind of working on that. Um, there's, a, there's a professor at the University of Maryland in the iSchool that's going to stand up some teams for me to mentor with him and do this over a two to three year time period to try to build a navigator just to solve that. So if anybody's got ideas, let me know um, because it ha happens to all of us and everything we do. Well, I have an idea. That was fabulous. That's my idea. That was fabulous, <laughs> Mel. This has really been a really good discussion. I got well, it's, a lot it's been fabulous it. because this has been a great group, Patrick, not because Thank I, you. Yeah. Well said. And yes, we have been productive. You know, not so much busy. This has been very productive. I want to thank everybody for having attended. Yeah. Chris, didn't quite hear you on that, Chris. I say, Patrick and, and Mel, thank you very much for a great event. Well, thank, thank you, everyone who attended and, uh, and for all your insight and wisdom and interaction. I mean, um, let's continue the conversation anytime you want between all of us. We... We should all be able to access each other and come back to Founders Forums as often as you can and to the Ask the Expert sessions because you know, your input is uh, equally, if not more valuable than those of us that lead these discussions. So thank you. Well said. And Friday at 11 a.m., we've got another couple of them coming up in September 20 and October 4th. We've got uh, startup project management, which I find very fascinating because you guys have all been through a startup enough to know that classic for project management it has a place in a startup, but a startup has so much chaos and pivot. How can you apply the classic project management? Well, it can be done. And our guest next time, Jason Monserrani, is going to bring that to us. Again, thank you for all attending. Thank you. Hope thank to see you, you next time. Everybody and thank you. you for all. all right. Talk to you soon.